Hello and welcome to Innovation Day 2020. Today we have a very, very interesting expert learning session. Uh, the evolution of the hybrid cloud. Uh, hybrid cloud, some people may be familiar with the IT version of the hybrid cloud. We're going to talk about something people may not be familiar with, and that's the extension of this hy hybrid cloud or a tethered cloud. We're also going to talk about the telco version of, of cloud computing. Some people may not even know that that exists, but we're going to talk about the telco cloud and the extension of that, which is the mobile edge cloud. I'm Stephen Carlini. I'm Schneider Electric Vice President of Innovation for the Energy Management Division. I've been talking about data centers for a while now. I got involved with 5G early on, and I've been involved with the World Economic Forum's 5G work group, where I lead the data center aspect of that work group. Let's talk about the industry in general. The industry in general, the data center industry, is moving to extreme ends of, of the spectrum. Very, very small computing and very, very large computing. And why is that? Well, there's experts that say that 75 to 80 percent of processing is actually going to be done on the edge. So that's a huge increase of where it is today. So we're going to need many, many more of these, these, these micro data centers, all deployed very close to the users and the data. On the storage side, it's a different story. Storage is moving more and more into hyperscale data centers, or centralized. Why is that? Well, number one, they have the capacity uh, to handle large volumes of, of data. And number two, they have the technology to optimize the cost of that data and the performance of that data to deliver it to you. So the latest Hollywood movies, for example, would be called what's called hot storage, and they'll put that in you know some technology that's you know fast and easy to access, like like flash or, or something else. Um, you know other things that are called cold storage, which are things that you probably won't access very often. Say you take a video of a fireworks show that you think is interesting at the time, uh, you, you know download it to your cloud, but you may or may not ever access that again. That would be what's called. Uh, cold storage and put that in tape or some media like that. It takes longer to get to, uh, but it's much more uh, cost effective to store. So there's certain things like there's certain videos and things from a legal perspective or from an HR perspective that are required to keep in, keep in storage for a long time. These will also go in, into cold storage. So you're seeing, you're seeing uh, very, very large growth in that. So cloud computing. Like I said, a lot of people are, are familiar with the cloud computing, and cloud computing started with just the large for the time, you know, central clouds. So, you know, one very large uh, cloud serving lots of people in big geographic areas. Uh, as cloud computing got more popular, uh, there was increased demands on performance. So the cloud companies started moving those data centers closer and closer to users, and that's the regional edge. That's really the urbanization of cloud computing, uh, moving the data centers closer to the users. To go even closer to the users or go to the local edge, we're talking about moving these data centers on-premise or very, very close to on-premise. So uh, an update of the architecture. But not all these local edge data centers are going to be created equal, you know, at least at the beginning. You have your hybrid clouds that are just a, a, a cloud architecture where you're processing some things locally on premise and you have some applications that are running in the cloud. This is the most basic definition of cloud computing and the one that people are most familiar with. When you start integrating the data plane and how the data is transacted and stored, uh, then you get into what we call a loosely tied hybrid cloud. Say you're in a your enterprise is a banking institution of some kind. Somebody takes out a loan at a local branch. Um, you know the data is is stored every er, shared everywhere in the network. They cannot go down the street to another bank branch and take out the same loan because it's it's known that that loan was already taken. Uh, the next um, the next version or the next advancement of hybrid clouds is what we call the tightly tied hybrid clouds, which is integrating the the control planes. The control planes actually control the data planes. So those are the routing protocols, the policy, and the roles of how the data is transmitted. If you if you duplicate the control plane and the data plane on your local cloud, then you have a really much a local instance of that cloud computing. You may not have all of the cloud services and all of the applications running locally that you have 
are running in the cloud. When you do that, when you have everything the same, uh, that's what we call true distributed local edge hybrid clouds. So any node in that network, you're going to have the same exact like-for-like -like experience. Um, so you're going to be able to run all of the same applications in the same way and have access to all of the data in real time. So the internet giants are the ones that are bringing these distributed clouds to the local edge. They're calling them tethered clouds. And tethered clouds um, have actually been around for, for a few years. And Microsoft was one of the first ones to, to announce these, these tethered clouds. So the, smart, the sizes go from, from 6U all the way up to like four full racks of these tethered clouds. The functionality um, is not right away like for like, you know, versions of the of the central cloud. You start with loosely tied, you know, integrating the data planes. There may be some that are more tightly tied or integrated control planes. Uh, they're eventually working towards like for like cloud service. So Microsoft's business plan, as I said, they were reversed with their Azure stacks, was to sell the software. So they were they were they were certifying IT partners to do the, the solutions, the physical solutions of the servers, the switches, and to, to work with customers installing those and, and managing those those applications. Here's you see a version that uh, Schneider put together with HPE that's going to be available very very, very shortly. Uh, Amazon Outpost has a little bit different business model. They announced this business model in December of 2019 where they're actually selling uh, the hardware and service stack. Uh, they're selling it to you, but you have the option. You can deploy it, you can manage it, you can upgrade it yourself, or you can partner with, or you can, uh, you know, pay Amazon to use one of their certified partners to do that for you. So you can you can take ownership of it yourself, or you could you have them provide most of the work for you. Google is the newest one into this, and Google Anthos. So they're going to be more of an open system. It's not really clear. Um, if Google's going to sell solutions, just provide specs. But they're going to be an extension uh, of the Google Cloud platform that'll be more open and use Kubernetes and things like that. Uh, IBM does not have an offer on the hardware side. They're just going to help companies who are uh, deploying these clouds and deploying, in some cases, you know, one, two, or all three of these, these clouds locally. So they have a thing called Mi Micro Cloud Manager. So what's the advantage to the enterprise? Why would they want to do this? Well, elasticity or, or, or bursting. So if you deploy you know, a local edge cloud, you have a big increase in business, you're going to want to be able to expand your IT capacity. So you could easily do that by bursting into the central cloud. Latency, because these are you know, on your premise or very close to on your premise, uh, they're going to perform you know, much well. There won't be any data congestion because everything is going to be done on site. Redundancy, like I said, like for like services, if you lose, you know, your connection to the central cloud is a problem with the central cloud. You can run everything lo locally or, or vice versa. Um, geopolitical issues, so data sovereignty, data privacy, uh, those are you know big issues right now. Having uh, a local tethered cloud on premise, you can configure that to have a lot of storage and you could keep all of the storage for your company on premise so you can be in compliance with these regulations. Simplification, like I said, you could choose to deploy these, um, uh, manage them yourself, or you can outsource the, the internet giant to do it for you. So what's in it for the internet giants? The internet giants want to improve you know, the customer satisfaction. They want, to, they want to have their customers to have the flexibility to have these like-for-like -like tethered cloud services. Um, on the local network, on the local instance of the cloud, or or the central version of the cloud, uh, they also want to expand the, their services. They want to not only provide services that they cloud services that they have right now, but they could expand in things like telco 5G, for example, because 5G is is a software defined application that is aggregated from uh, from from the hardware, so that they could they could run the 5G application on local phone, five. Uh, IT servers. Um, they could also open up services to, to, to you know, governments, to cities. They could uh, deploy a mesh network of these tethered clouds and start um, offering services like, like traffic control, um, smart utilities, um, automated driving, because 
you know, the amount of data that's going to be transmitted by, by automated vehicles is going to be so high, you're going to need a, a mesh network of these tether clouds to be able to um, accurately operate uh, in, in the city. Also targeted for personal use. And once you have the mesh networks, you can add applications that people can run off their phones. So this is going to take a while, these four phases. You know, obviously we're just starting in phase one. Uh, but in phase two, where I talked about these, these, these internet giants adding more services, here's an example of one that's already underway. AT&T very much wanted to um, deploy 5G in a city, and Microsoft really wanted to extend their cloud platform. There's your platform in a city. So they worked out a deal where a tethered cloud was deployed in AT&T central offices. So it was a single rack system, and it's running Microsoft Azure stack and the services associated with that, and also the 5G application. So you're starting to see the merger of, of IT and telco at the local edge. Let's talk about 5G. And 5G is coming, but it's not coming uh, right away or all at once. It's going to take a while for 5G to roll out. And there's different types of 5G. The 5G that we're talking about today is the millimeter wave or the high band 5G. So it's, it's the one that's the fastest that people are talking about. Some people call it 5G plus now. So it has, has many names. Um, one thing about it, it's not com backward compatible with 4G or, or 3G. So you need new phones. You also need uh, a, a new radio access network because the spectrums that you, these operate at are, you know, in the gigahertz starting, you know, and the gigahertz range up to 300 gigahertz. So you need a new radio access networks. And just to note that these radio access networks at these high frequencies have high propagation losses, which means they don't go that far. And they also are, are subject to interference between, you know, they don't go through walls very well. They don't go through people. They don't even penetrate like leaves on trees. Um, so the other thing about 5G is that the mobile edge, mobile edge cloud architecture is needed, and we'll talk about why that's needed uh, very soon. Uh, and the build-out cost, the original the original projection of how much it was going to cost to build this 5G was 300 billion euros. But now it's been raised to 1.3 trillion euros, so it's going to take, you know, a little a little while to, to roll that out on a global perspective. But once it is rolled out, here are some of the promises, less than one millisecond of latency, so instantaneous communication. So when you have instantaneous communication, you can, you can do certain things that you weren't, weren't possible before, like robotic surgery. Um, having a surgeon on, you know, a different country, you know, operate on you because, you know, it's in real time uh, would be possible with a robotic extension of that. Robotic extension of police uh, chasing bad guys, remotely controlling robots to do that, to, to, to put human life uh, uh, in safety and not at risk uh, by using robot controls. Holograms is probably the most interesting one. Uh, um, so instead of communicating, you know, in, in two dimensions, you communicate, you know, with people in three dimensions. The extension of that is, is haptic technology or kinesthetic communications where uh, the holograms actually have a touching and feeling aspect to them. So absolutely uh, uh, unbelievable things that, that, that are being you know, touted with 5G. But one of the things that could get in the way is physics. So here we have Albert Einstein and the theory of relativity, uh, energy, mass times the speed of light squared. And we're going to focus on the speed of light. The speed of light, 300 million, million meters per second, is very, very fast. Um, it's so fast that it's the theoretical limit of how fast things can go. So a nice, a nice uh, joke I like to, uh, I like to, to reference is from a deadpan comic, uh, Stephen Wright. So if you're traveling in a spaceship that's traveling at the speed of light, and you turn the lights on, does anything happen? So think about that. <laughs> so the speed of light, like I said, 300 million meters per second. So 300 million meters per second is very fast, but uh, theoretically, a round trip from New York to LA, which is around 9,000 kilometers, uh, will take a massless particle in a vacuum 40 milliseconds. But when we're talking about data, data is not massless, 
and the fastest way to transmit data is in fiber optic cables. So fiber optic cables, the data tra uh, transfers in, it actually bounces, the data bounces within that uh, fiber optic cable, it doesn't go straight through. So there's a delay there, it also has to go through data hops, and the hops transfer from one high-speed network to the other high-speed network, and when you transfer from network to network, you have delays. So the real best case round trip from New York to LA is 90 milliseconds. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because the promises of 5G uh, are going to require that you have a local instance of that network very close to you. So this is where we bring in the, the Mobile Edge Cloud. So the local edge version of the telco architecture. As you can see, the telco cloud architecture is almost identical to the IT cloud architecture. Um, but you see at the, at, the, at the bottom, you know, the different, the different functions. It's a, it's a mix of, of RANs, radio access networks, these high speed, high frequency radio access networks that we talked about and that are being supported by local edge mobile computing or MECs. So what is a MEC exam exactly? What does it do? Like I said before, the 5G application is software defined, which means it's dis disaggregated from the hardware. This wasn't the case before. You bought the hardware and the firmware and the software it was including it in, in, in legacy telco. So with 5G, you can deploy a standard IT servers and switches at the local edge in these MEC data centers. <clears throat> So they deliver, you know, the, the, the functions that you're, you're familiar with, 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 with telco, uh, which is call routing and automation, things like that. But you can also do content delivery, computations, things that are more, um, more IT centric. You can also do network function virtualization uh, and network slicing with, with, within these, uh, these uh, MEC data centers. So big, big change in, in the way that uh, telco is being deployed with the cost that we, we talked about earlier, the very, very high cost, to deploy these, these, these RANs and these MECs is, is quite expensive. So there has to be a business case. So a lot of the carriers are doing, and in this case I'm showing Boston, is, is doing coverage maps. So the only, the only places where uh, there's a valid business case are densely populated areas. So the densely populated areas in Boston drew the circles to show the, the opportunities to, to deploy uh, high band 5G. Here's an actual example of LA where they already deployed uh, 5G. As you can see, it's not universal coverage. 4G would very much coverage everywhere in 5G is, is more in clusters. Here you see the coverage in, in UAE again. Uh, only in, in densely populated areas where, where there's a business case. We have to say that the initial test cases, I talked about the propagation losses of 5G, and a lot of the cities that deployed it had questionable results. So here's a, here's a 5G tower and small cell, and when you're very, very close to the tower, small cell, and you're outside, uh, you have very, very high speeds. As soon as you start walking away from it, uh, the, the, the signal degradation is, is, is much higher than in 4G. And once you go inside, uh, the signal you know, pretty much goes away. And if you're know, trying to, to go through trees or leaves, uh, the signal is also blocked. So a lot of the test cities actually had to cut down uh, trees in, in their downtown areas for, for 5G to op operate well. So um, technology is, is, is having a little bit of challenge. The mobile, mobile edge uh, data centers to support those 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 small cells that, that we just showed and those lampposts are going to be uh, placed, like I said, very, you know, everywhere that they can, everywhere that they can find a space to put them. Here we show rooftop examples. They're also going to be in parking lots. They're also going to be in basements of buildings. So the the mo the, the, the max you know communicate usually through fiber optic to the towers, so you don't have the issue with with uh, propagation losses and line of sight uh, antennas because they're connected through uh, fiber optics. So you're gonna see these MEC data centers uh, popping up everywhere. Here's an example of a, a local edge MEC. This is a, this is a design, the reference design that uh, we did with uh, Verizon by their specs. You see this one has uh, four servers and two Cisco switches. This is an example, an early example of what these uh, mobile edge cloud data centers are gonna look like. And like I said, we're working with uh, the World Economic Forum. Here's a case study that was published uh, from Schneider Electric that shows that in order to, to deploy 5G globally, 
uh, we're going to need seven and a half million uh, of these MEC data centers. So seven and a half million of the, of the MEC data centers is, is, is quite a lot. There's currently about five million base stations for 4G. So um, as and, and I said, 5G uh, high band coverage will not be everywhere because there's really not a business case for it. So that's taking that into account as well. So to sum it up, the internet giants are moving their cloud services uh, into these distributed edge tethered clouds. There's going to be a move to the local edge and to on-premise, and there's going to be uh, mesh networks of these of these uh, IT cloud computing architectures locally. Uh, 5G also needs a mesh network, um, what they call mobile edge clouds, and because the technologies that, that these run on, which are standard IT servers, are the same, I think the business case is, is that these are going to be deployed together. So you're going to have the internet giants and telco carriers uh, coming together to provide the cloud services as well as the, the 5G application through the same tethered cloud local edge distributed architecture. So I'm Stephen Carlini. I hope you found this uh, helpful and informative and thank you for your time. Thank you.